Welcome to the 2021 GPFF Live Online Conversation. Today, we're going to be talking with Jeffrey Reichert and Bariha Zaman. Uh, these are terrific filmmakers who have honored us in the past with, uh, with their films, and we are really looking forward to the conversation. So let's get started. Thank you. Thanks so much for asking us to do this. It was really um, a lovely way to connect and think back on our work during a strange time. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, yeah. and welcome. We're so happy to be talking to you. And we have a long history together. We have actually shown three of your films in earlier festivals. Um, the first one was gerrymandering back in, what was it? I think that was in yeah. 2010, right. Then uh, the next, in 2013, we showed Remote Area Medical. And in 2014, we showed This Time Next Year. So, um, so we're, you know, we're truly thrilled to be reconnecting with you. And so tell us a little bit about your work, about those films, about how you can see it. And also wanted to say that um, we're an Indie Lens pop-up partner and our next uh, film is Nine to Five, The Story of a Movement, which Fariha is a uh, coordinating, no. A uh, consulting, consulting producer, producer. Uh, yeah. So do tell us a little bit about that film. Sure. I think it's a good starting place actually, even in, in thinking about how Jeff and I see our work because the directors of that film, um, Julia Reichert and Steve Bognar are uh, definitely mentors and uh, guides and have um, helped us think about, you know, the kind of um, contribution we want to make to the world. Um, so nine to five, the story of a movement, I think what's incredible about that, it, it's about um, the sort of, uh, um, the, the role that women had to play in fighting against unfair labor practice and specifically um, throughout the 70s and 80s in um, uh, secretarial work. But of course, um, historically, there are always uh, some field where, where women are sort of the predominant workforce and not necessarily getting their fair due even compared to them, their male counterparts. Um, it's a really incredible film. I, and I think it's so a part of their, um, their, their body of work and their history of work. And even though they experiment and they go towards other topics, I think what, what connects to me in talking about um, Jeff and I's work together is that idea that when you look at it, you think, of course they made this movie, of course this had to be them, of course it's sort of, you know, you know, the, the next stage in discussing the things that matter to them and that there's a sense of their values throughout their, their body of work. Um, and I'd say, I don't always know how to track those things as we're making it, but even speaking with you, and thank you again so much for supporting and, and showing our work um, over many years, but, you know, I think about um, the importance of sense of place to us, the importance of sort of centering um, human experience and allowing that to speak for, um, for the, the politics that um, inherently undergird it, that it doesn't necessarily need to be um, explicitly said or spoken out loud. But yeah, we're, we're, we're always trying to find ways to creatively and sort of um, compassionately engage with um, ju with with justice and social justice. So I think that's a, a thread that um, that uh, I'm starting to see, <laughs> even as you know, sort of. Um, uh, I guess we're approaching mid career <laughs> filmmakers. <laughs> yeah, it, um, it is an it's an interesting thing. And so you know, people who who see gerrymandering wouldn't know this, but um, you know, over the course of making the film, it started off you know, the early shoots were incredibly interview driven. Um, and there was, it was, it, was, it was kind of like a very static process in a lot of ways. And then as things went along, you know, there, there just was a feeling of like, ah, oh God, we just gotta get out and just be with people and be in places with people. And so, you know, in the film, everything is all kind of mixed and scrambled together. Um, but if you see, you know, going from gerrymandering to remote area medical, if you understand that trajectory in the context of shooting gerrymandering, you can see, oh yeah, we wanted to, sort of meet people in the places that they were yeah. moving around in space a bit more and relying less on, you know, sitting down and doing interviews. I mean, you know, Remote Area Medical is a film that I think there's a way that could have been made where it relied a lot on experts and could have talked about the national healthcare system and, you know, Obamacare and all those different kinds of issues. But we said very much, you know, 
that we didn't want to do that. We were moving in kind of a different direction that was focusing more on these sort of um, kind of immediate, using immediate experiences and people's experiences and histories to access these larger questions as opposed to gerrymandering, which has scholars and politicians, legislators, et cetera, et cetera. Um, oh, go, go ahead. <laughs> sure, Remote Area Medical was the first film that Jeff and I directed together. And um, I think that Jeff can sometimes be very hard on gerrymandering, which I, I also worked on and appreciate very much. Um, but I, I think, uh, that really being my first film and being such a logistically ambitious first film, um, I still think about some of the lessons that I learned there and what it taught me about the kind of work that I want us to make. Um, Jeff and I both teach uh, in different capacities. In fact, he's wearing his Bronx Documentary Center sweatshirt right now. And um, one of the things that I talk about is uh, all the time is like I show, I show remote area medical and I say, here's what I thought we were gonna make going in. And here are all the ways that it changed to become what you see, including things like we never, you know, we had this sort of stringent vision about being a Wiseman-esque, um, uh, strictly verite film. And then, of course, you know, in connecting with people and talking to people who are from a region where they feel like they're very overlooked by the rest of, of society, how could we not allow them to speak for themselves? Okay, that, you know, that's one way in which you let the the experience on the ground shape you and shape the film. And um, another was we had no idea. We thought it would be so narrowly focused on the um, the, the the clinic that's presented within uh, the film, which is about a group that does free pop up medical clinics around the country. Um, and uh, then we realized, well, if you don't see the landscape, if you don't see the beautiful Tennessee hills, then how can you understand why people? want to be here and live here and form a community here, even though it's challenging and difficult. So I think some of those things still um, feature really heavily, you know, the like listen to the people that you're talking to, really understand what the sense of place is and find a way to try and communicate that. So other people who are watching it understand what, what these people are about. Um, it's been a, a touchstone still. It's, it's a, there's, there's a particular set of scenes in remote area medical that have stayed with me for two really important reasons. Um, one, because it, um, the, the vulnerability that you capture in this one particular woman's story mm -hmm. um, really demonstrated uh, not only your, you know, your kind of um, openness and your respect for their humanity, um, uh, you know, but it did show, for as you're saying now, you know, your kind of openness to going where, the, you know, where the story is, right? But it did mean that you had to gain their trust, and and I certainly want to uh, uh, to kind of have you open that up a little bit. But the reason I wanted to share why that why that particular scene, and I'll explain it for for people who may, may not have seen it, there's a woman who who badly needs dental work. And, and she needs it so badly because it is, it is keeping her from gainful employment. And, and so she's trapped in this, this cycle of poverty, right? But her pride is keeping her from initially accepting the opportunity for this, this free medical. And, and her husband is so tender in the way that he tries to encourage her. Um, I mean, so on a human level, it is, you know, it really shows a remarkable comfort that you created for them to be able to share that. But I have to say, over the years, that scene took on a, a, a different, more intense um, meaning for me as we entered the Trump era. Mm. And I tried to always look back on that, on that woman's situation and her thought processes and to remember her humanity and how much empathy I felt for her when I was thinking about how, you know, how we got into the situation we are yeah. and why some people might be attracted to this particular type of set of politics. Mm -hmm. I know that's not what at all what you intended in the film, but um, I just think it also speaks to the strength of, of, you know, and the power of filmmaking when it, you know, when it really touches something real and human that it can, you know, it can carry on beyond as you're saying, for just to, you know, just having experts talk about healthcare stats and you can, you know. Yeah, I think you're probably, I think you're talking about Val probably, um, who, um, she was so amazing to work with. 
on that film. Um, and I think, you know, part of it for us is, it's about making sure that the people that you're talking to and working with to make these films um, don't feel as if you're just there to kind of get the things that you need to make the movie that you had thought you were going to make, if that makes sense. And so with Val, um, you know, a lot of that interview in the film, I think is, if I remember correctly, is the first interview we did with her kind of a few days before the clinic going out to where she lived. And, you know, we made a point to not just, you know, harp on, you know, what are the issues with your teeth? Explain the problems. Well, we talked all about her life over the course of a few hours. And I think, you know, when people who you're filming understand that you're interested in them, um, not just as something that's going to be turned into a piece of footage and put on a timeline and then eventually shown in a movie, but actually you're curious about, you know, the more than just that stuff. I think it, it, it paves the way really to, you know, having that kind of comfort. And of course, a lot of the people we filmed, a lot of people we interviewed hadn't, you know, they'd never been on in front of a camera before and people were nervous. But I think once you start to ask them about things that sort of impact them in a, you know, impact the reality about their histories, fond memories, things like that, then it just, it starts to get easier. I wanted to jump back to something that Tori has, had said about the process of filmmaking and how the, that you, you know, what you teach and how it's different when uh, you know you go in thinking you're going to do one thing, and and the road to finishing the you know to finishing shooting and then finishing the film goes someplace else, and if you can address that in your work a little bit more. Sure. I mean, to me, that's uh, of course um, there's an exploratory nature to making any work, but I think of it as the particular thrill of documentary making that I want. Um, I want to embrace um, how it feels to be surprised by someone in front of you, which happens constantly. As you get to know somebody, they surprise you constantly. I'm feeling a little emotional talking about it because it's a kind of interaction that um, I feel that we're, we're missing at this moment. The, the, it's important to stay connected to your loved ones, but I also think it's important to sort of make more space in your heart for, um, for, for other people and people whose lives may not resemble yours as closely and bring bring new ideas to that. And I, if that's the sort of personal um, experience of making a documentary, then I also think the uh, film should reflect that, that um, it has to bend in the way that you should, um, as opposed to, you know, feeling like there's this sort of rigid structure and, and everything goes to just fill that space, right? It, it has to, um, it has to, move with the world in order to better reflect it. Um, you know, something that I remember after having made remote area medical and, and then going into this time next year was, okay, I have learned this lesson a little bit. How do we find ways to um, incorporate our desire to reflect the reality of this community and reflect the environment in the filmmaking part of it in a way that I just didn't have the ability to articulate or think through in advance on the previous film. So we scheduled all, you know, we had interviews, we had events that we had to go to, all of these, you know, sort of things that make you comforted when you look on paper and say, okay, I know what I'm doing today. And then we would just set like a, a few hours aside every day that we filmed to go to the ocean and film what it was like on the beach. I saw kinds of things that I had never really sat with before, like, when a wave recedes from the shore and the sand sort of like lightly dries over the next several minutes. And, you know, the idea was how do we explain the life of someone who's, who's so connected to the ocean and where it's a part of their every day, if we don't understand that and we don't try to make that part of the film, if the process of the film didn't involve um, listening to the environment and, and uh, sort of recreating that cycle. So I, I, I think that what you do day to day matters. And that's another way that we sort of try to incorporate um, being shaped by the specific movie that we're making and the specific folks that we're talking to. Yeah, there's one thing that, you know, I, we both teach as teachers free us and talk in other classes and I'll often get um, questions about like, what is like, what do you, what is the most important thing about being like a good um, documentary camera person? Mm -hmm. um, and for me, it's, it's like, you know, 
anybody can learn to use a camera and use lenses and all the all of the all of the kind of technical tricks that you that you can learn to be you know proficient in a certain sense but if you can't be a good person in space around the people that you're filming with then you're not going to get anything worthwhile if people are afraid of you or uncomfortable around you or nervous that reads on camera and so the most important thing is is sort of like is about you as a person and how you are in the world essentially Makes a lot of sense. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. It really does come through. <laughs> and you know, um, one of the things that that you know, um, once the film is is made, one of the things that we really look for in curating our programs, because we really think of ourselves as a as a a, a social change, as a as a peace organization that uses the arts mostly film. You know, is is we look for those films that that have that, that create that human connection, but that do um, offer our audience a model or, or at least um, a signal of how they can, you know, take some kind of positive action in their own lives. Because that, that was what was so wonderful about War Three Films. Gerrymandering, we worked with the League of Women Voters, um, with uh, 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 this time next year, there was actually a, a concerted impact campaign, and we were part of that program presenting um, a seminar for climate resilience, um, which uh, Nina, you can certainly speak to. Um, we we were we were disappointed in in how um, it didn't have a greater impact. And then, what was it? Three years later. Three years later, yes, um, Hurricane Irma hit. Um, hit Central Florida really, you know, it hit our area really badly. And when we brought that seminar to, uh, to Orlando, it was, you know, several years after the, the last bad hurricane that had hit the area and people had just grown complacent. Mm. It's, you know, it's, it is, uh, it, it's a huge, it's the human condition, right? You know? But we were we were so glad to be a part of that program, um, and you know, we were able to say these are you know at least we had at the ready some things to, to offer people in that moment. And, uh, and so it's something it's something we like to do at the festival. We like to help uh, filmmakers um, test their impact campaigns. So um, you know even sometimes even an unsuccessful uh, you know venture is more educational for both us and the filmmaker as well as the audience so um you know so we were really thrilled to do that we were and it did come in handy when irma had hit because the 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 film festival then really um uh uh we really turned into this hub for we had electricity and and wi-fi at some of our locations where mm -hmm. people did not and we were this, they, we ended up being this, this place for first responders. Mm -hmm. And we also ended up being this place because shortly thereafter Maria had hit. And we ended up being this, you know, acting as this, this kind of hub for an exchange of information about what was happening to folks in Puerto Rico who had relatives and friends in the, in the Central Florida area. Yeah, I mean, that stuff was really wonderful to hear. I mean, it's like, there are a lot of questions about how you know, how much and to what extent documentaries can affect change. I mean, we, you know, you see these documentaries that come out and they have huge impact campaigns, they have huge releases. And it's like, well, what did, like, what actually happened? And hearing that, like, this time next year could inspire these sort of, like, this local inspiration for when the hurricane came to you is really great. I mean, for Remote Area Medical, the woman that you're, um, that you mentioned with her dental issues, Val, somebody read her story um, in a news article written about the film when it premiered at Full Frame and somehow found her and paid for her dental work. Wow. And so, yeah, you know, sure, sure, the film, it inspired a lot of people to volunteer and donate to the Remote Area Medical Organization, which is great. But, you know, I think for us, you know, being able to have that kind of one-to-one -one impact on somebody's life through a film that we made, um, and, you know, it wasn't a concerted effort to try to raise money for Dallas mental surgery. Somebody just saw it and felt moved by it. I think that's really wonderful. Sometimes those little, you know, it, it's what we think are those little actions or those little impacts, you know, magnify so incredibly. And I've always thought that that, you know, that the most important thing is the 
you know, the, the most important thing I can do is if I can impact one person, you know, so those one person impacts really ripple out. And there's so much that's hard to measure. I mean, of course, we're, we're, we're grateful for, for bigger steps or even with remote area medical, um, we heard that a number, they, the organization helped uh, or the organization used the film to help change state legislation in a number of places where they had wanted to set up clinics, but they wouldn't allow out-of-state doctors for solely sort of uh, either antiquated laws or they wanted the licensing fees or what have you. So those things happen, but um, you know, some of the the experiences that stay with me too are people's. Uh, reactions and and sort of feedback about the film so um joe mangino who's in this time next year uh told us at one point you know when you you because i've been part of this film i can take stock of what it has been like over the past year and sometimes that's difficult and sometimes it's joyous but it's like my therapy and it's allowed me to like really understand like what's happened in this otherwise pretty traumatic time and that is Absolutely, you know, to Jeff's point, that's going to stay with me for the rest of my life. Um, and I think that it's uh, really important to have very explicitly explicit advocacy films. I don't want one kind of film in the world or one kind of documentary in the world. For us, I think it's about finding that balance where of course we want um, to, to affect concrete change, but the starting point is, can you look at this person's life and understand something differently because you have. Oh. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Joe went on, um, Joe Mangino, the star of this time next year, organized a lot of the local relief efforts on Long Beach Island. He, um, he was later, um, not long after the film, he was inspired to help um, organize people to build a skate park in the town that they didn't have. Then he went on and ran and won a seat on the school board. Yeah. And then he <laughs> ran for mayor. I mean, he didn't win, but he will probably run again. And he texted us at one point during the campaign and said, you know, he was, I was thinking about you guys and I, I, I'm running for mayor right now. And I never would have done this if I hadn't been able to see the actions that I'd done around Sandy through your film. It's, it's a real gift that, that you've given us, you know, that it's a, it's a mutual gift, right? It's a gift they've given you with their openness and a gift yeah. to them with uh, the ability to have that perspective on themselves that they wouldn't have. Otherwise. Yeah, thank, thank goodness we've heard those kinds of things because otherwise all I think about is I would never be in a documentary. It's so <laughs> hard to give in that way. We're incredibly grateful. It's not an, it's not an easy thing to be taken lightly to, no. to sort of, yeah, no. put your you life, know, no, make your life I open. <laughs> I, I know you probably don't, uh, you know, think about ever revisiting your film, but if you ever want to revisit gerrymandering, this was certainly we would love to have. relevant. Yes. <laughs> oh yeah, sure. I'm sure the League of Women Voters would be thrilled to have it back again. <laughs> yeah. no, it, it, such great grassroots work with that film, Jeff. Don't no, forget it, that. We did a lot of work, and I at one point a few years ago, I, I the League of Women Voters folks emailed and they said. Could we, could we arrange a thing where we could just show the movie whenever we wanted to? Would we have to do it? I was like, I was, it was like 10 years or eight years from finishing the movie. I said, show the movie any way you want, anywhere you can. If you can buy a DVD, because it helps the DVD distributor, but just show the movie. Um, and so I think they're doing screenings all the time. And I don't even know how far that's gotten, but there's been another gerrymandering film that's come out. And so I hope that people will, you know, finally start to wake up and pay attention to this. Yeah. So what what is what's next for you guys and how can our audiences uh, support your work? Because, you know, you really do have an amazing uh, body of work. Um, let us know what you know, how we can get the word out for you. And also tell us where um, where people can find your that work that we've been talking about that you've been talking about. Um, th thank you. Thanks so much. Um, so Jeff and I always have a number of projects percolating. Um, we've tried some new and interesting things. For example, the last feature we worked on is called Feast of the Epiphany um, and it's uh, screening via the Museum of the Moving Image website. So you can stream it now as part of their virtual theater offerings. But that is more uh, of a, it actually still has a lot of 
um, social issue concern, but it's a hybrid. It's a, part of it is scripted and part of it is documentary. Uh, we've both um, started doing some producing work because we realized that uh, in addition to, to directing and helming in that way, we really love um, kind of supporting other filmmakers and finding a way to bring their vision to light. So I can talk about where some of that work is available. I'll start with the more recent. So um, Jeff produced the film American Factory for Julia Reichert and Steve Bognar, which is on Netflix. Um, I produced a short film called Ghost of Sugarland um, by Basam Tharik, who's a really amazing, talented filmmaker, which is also on Netflix. Um, we have a short called To Be Queen that was a New York Times op doc. Um, the series that it's part of is about immigration called From Here to Home. There's some really wonderful films in this series and um, it was actually nominated for an, for an Emmy. So that's on um, the New York Times website. So easily findable. Um, what else? Uh, well, there's American Carnage, which oh, is right. <laughs> different from a lot of the films we've been talking about. We made a, in 2017, we were part of a program with um, Field Division and Firelight Media where they were, they would ask filmmakers to respond it was called R100 Days, and they were asking filmmakers to respond to the idea of the Trump presidency in early 2017. And at around that time, we'd become really fascinated with the idea that Steve Bannon had made documentary films for a while before becoming um, the head of Breitbart. I think he's actually still making films. And so we made a movie essentially kind of deconstructing how his movies work and how he sort of um, pushes his far right ideologies through tactics that are similarly seen in Hollywood films. And that um, that's on the Field Division website, the movie's called American Carnage. And again, please, I, I hope people will watch all the shorts. It's so interesting to, to look back and take stock on, you know, some of the issues that people highlighted in those first 100 days, still relevant, even under a different presidency. So I think it's a really good time to revisit. And then Jeff and I, with our um, another collaborator, Michael Koreski, made a, a short documentary recently that um, uh, is sort of around the artistic process. So it's more about um, how film, filmmakers and critics respond to work. And um, we we had done this workshop with uh, com with a combination of filmmakers and critics, uh, like literally the week before. Um, New York locked down and we all knew better not to do those things. So it's been, again, sort of an interesting way to look back. Um, and that's on the reverse shot website. So reverse shot.org, which is why that's the website that you'll see in the slide. It's our most recent piece. And then just in terms of the films that have been mentioned, um, those are all, so uh, gerrymandering, remote area medical, and this time next year are available uh, in the places where you typically go to, um, to rent or buy a, a movie online. So available on iTunes and Amazon and... Uh, Other random... <laughs> yeah. Whatever, whatever the things people are Wherever using. you find your movies. Yeah. Um, yeah, so those are not no longer streaming for free, but um, still living on the internet. Well, listen, thank you all so much. Uh, and thank you, uh, uh, audience out there, uh, for watching our 2021 inaugural uh, Global Peace Film Festival Lives Online. We're, we're really so, uh, so appreciative of uh, Jeffrey and Faria for taking so much time with us and for being so open. And we can't wait to see what you're uh, doing next so that we have another chance to chat with you. Check out reverseshot.org for their work and check out all of the Gold Peace Film Festival programming at peacefilmfest.org. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. Good to see you both. <laughs>